Very good, ladies and gentlemen. I suggest that uh, we make a start. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Giorgio Riello, and uh, for this academic year, I'm visiting Department 3, and I'm based at the University of Warwick. And it's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Pata Sarati. Uh, Prasanan um, teaches uh, South Asian history at Boston College, where he has now been for, uh, I believe, 20 years, Prasanan. Um, Prasanna is also one of those rare uh, scholars who, having trained as an economist, uh, decided that history was a more rewarding subject, perhaps not financially, but surely intellectually. He completed his PhD at Harvard in the early 90s, and uh, really, uh, Prasannan works at the intersection between history and economics, and indeed has been one of the leading voices of creating a new type of economic history, and eventually became one of the best-known scholars in the field of global history. Now, Prasannan lists of achievements uh, and service to the field of history broadly defined is far too long to detail here. So let me just say that the breadth of his scholarship is quite astonishing and ranges from labor history to medieval history, environmental history, global history, and of course, economic, political, and cultural history of South Asia. His transition to a colonial economy, weavers, merchants, and kings in South India, 1720 to 1800, was published with Cambridge University Press in 2001, made him a very well-known scholar on both sides of the Atlantic, as well as in Asia. His contribution was not just about a colonial economy, as the title suggests. It was also about the role of South Asia in broader, I would say, global geographies. The transition to a colonial economy should be read next to his seminal The Great Divergence article, a review article in Past and Present published in 2002, that remains, at least to my, my opinion, one of the, most, uh, the best and most cogent critiques of Kenneth Pomeran's The Great Divergence, that of course was published just a couple of years earlier. In that article, Prasannan uh, did not just raise the classic problems of agricultural productivity, but addressed the gaps, uh, the gaps in the Pomeranzian paradigm by pointing to the importance of technology, and secondly, perhaps most importantly, to the absence of South Asia and of connectivity in the ways in which uh, global history was developing its framework of analysis in the early 2000s. And these were the topics that Prasannan developed in his uh, next monograph, Why Europe Grew Rich and Asia Did Not, Global Economic Divergence 1600 to 1850, that was published again by Cambridge University Press in 2011. The book received the Jerry Bentley Book Prize uh, of the World History Association and was an instant success. Grappling with the problems put forward by Pomerantz, Prasannan pointed to the fact that resource endowment is not just to be found or exploited, uh, that coal was also present in China, and that it was actually institutions that are often important to understand historical processes. He showed these in seminal chapters, like a chapter on technology, but also in other chapters dedicated to a sector very dear to me, the cotton te textile industry. In between these projects, Prasannan found time to co-edit another book, The Spinning World. I cannot vouch on the quality of the content as I was the co-editor of this book, but I can say for sure that it had one of the most beautiful covers of any book ever. Perhaps with the exception of the book I did with Dagmar on silk. <laughs> So in recent years, um, Prasannan has been working on a book-length project on the, econo on the ecology of Tamil, uh, Tamil Nadu in southeast, uh, southeastern India in the 19th century, in particular on the issue of deforestation. Prasannan goes back to some of the topics that he developed in the 1990s, such as changes in agriculture and livelihoods, but also at the same time addresses a new scholarship in environmental history, and in particular on the history of the Anthropocene, a theoretical and historical issues that is, of course, global in scope and of which we will know much more tonight in this lecture.
Let me finally say that it is truly difficult to introduce a friend, as I feel that our speaker's human qualities are just as important as his academic pedigree, something that I must say that approaching middle age, I realize is not common at all. So, without further ado, uh, let me give you the floor, uh, give the floor to Prasanan, and we have actually no audiovisual, so I give you really the, the true floor. Thank you, Giorgio, for that very, very, very generous introduction. Now I know what a true friend you are. <laughs> and also thank you to Wilco, who's sitting back there, and Dogmod, for inviting me to speak here at the Mox Block. It's really an honor. The title of my uh, lecture today is Nature and the Writing of History. In 2012, the American Historical Review published a forum entitled Historiographic Turns in Critical Perspective. The aim of this forum was to understand the various turns that had shaped the writing and theorizing of history since the 1960s. Beginning with the enormous and intellectually transformative turn to social history, the participants examined a number of subsequent turns. Not surprisingly, given their profound impact, a great deal of attention was given to the turn to language and culture, but the forum also examined the imperial, the global, the post-colonial, and the archival turns. The natural world was conspicuously absent from the discussion only to be brought in briefly by Julia Adney Thomas, one of the commentators. The environmental turn, as she labeled it, was not only ignored in the forum, but continues to be absent in the most sophisticated histor uh, recent historiography, she wrote. However, historians must give attention to nature, Thomas argued, because alongside the turns analyzed here, a world-altering force has been emerging one larger, more de devastating, and more definitive even than the contemporary flexible forms of capitalism emphasized by William Sewell. I speak of climate change, Julia Thomas wrote, or climate collapse and all of its related global transformations. As Thomas's conclusion indicates, the dangers of climate change were already widely appreciated when this forum took place in the AHR. In 1992, the United Nations framework on climate change was agreed upon, and the signatory nations committed to reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. This framework was extended with the Kyoto Protocol of 1997, which entered into force in 2005. In 2007, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, and Al Gore shared the Nobel Peace Prize for their efforts to build up and disseminate greater knowledge about man-made climate change. Yet, a forum on historiographic turns in the flagship journal of the historical profession in the United States barely took notice of these momentous developments. The neglect of climate change in the forum is symptomatic of a larger neglect of nature in the writing of history. The environmental turn is the turn that never happened. It is the absence in the midst of all that is present, in Julia Thomas's words. The limited impact of the environmental turn is evident from influential accounts of the development of history writing in the post-war period, whether they be in a personal vein, such as those of Eric Holbsbaum, William Sewell, and Jeff Ely, or in a more scholarly mode, such as those of George Eggers and Daniel Wolfe. None of these histories of the discipline even raise the specter of an environmental turn or mention environmental history as a significant addition to the historian's craft. Environmental history merits a slim chapter by John McNeil in the fifth and final volume on history writing after 1945 of the Oxford History of Historical Writing, but there is only one other passing mention of the environmental turn in the whole volume. Come on in. <laughs> Environmental history has had a number of striking successes since its emergence in the 1970s. Of course, modern environmental history had antecedents in the 19th and early 20th centuries, 
George Perkins Marsh's Man and Nature, the Anal, and the geographical turn that Mark Bloch and Lucien Feb inaugurated, which came to fruition with Fernand Bordel's Mediterranean, come to mind immediately. However, in the 1970s and 1980s, led by historians of the United States, a number of works explored the relationship between humans and nature in strikingly new ways and attracted the attention of a growing number of scholars. In the United States, environmental historians established a thriving professional association, the American Society for Environmental History, which was founded in 1977 and publishes a lively journal, Environmental History, organizes an, annual, and organizes an annual meeting which attracts scholars from across the United States and around the world. And environmental history is now an integral component of the publishing efforts of a number of presses and articles. Um, and articles on the subject appear in leading journals. The introduction to an authoritative handbook on the field observes that, an environment, that environmental concerns have made their way into leading textbooks in Europe, world, and US history, in marked contrast to the situation some three decades ago. Despite these successes, it is difficult to avoid the conclusion that environmental history has not fulfilled its promise. For environmental history has had a limited impact on the discipline as a whole. The majority of historians continue to operate as if humans were not part of a larger natural world or planetary system. Ellen Strood, a US environmental historian, has put it bluntly. Environmental history remains on the periphery of the profession. Colleges and universities have begun hiring in environmental historians. We have an excellent journal devoted to our field. US history textbooks have begun to include sections and sidebars on environmental history. But the new scholarship only rarely finds its way into classrooms of non-environmental historians, into the pages of mainstream journals, or into the main body of textbooks. Strude asserts that this is very far from the impact that environmental historians set out to achieve, which was to create scholarship indispensable to the master narratives of history, reshaping all understandings of the past through our analysis of the role of nature in our lives and society. Strude is not alone in this assessment, and similar sentiments have been voiced by Ted Steinberg and Lawrence Culver in the United States, and Sverker uh, Sorlin and Paul Ward, who come to a similar conclusion from Europe. Sorlin and Ward write that as a field, environmental history has made many gains, but in Europe, the field remains marginalized, and in the United States, they argue, has had a fairly minimal impact on mainstream history writing. The failure of environmental history is especially striking when it is contrasted with the successes of other turns. Where the environmental turn has failed, other turns have succeeded in reshaping the core narratives of regional and national histories around the world. Who can imagine teaching an introductory survey of modern South Asian history, which I do almost every year, without the insights of the social, gender, cultural, post-colonial, imperial, and global turns being at the center of the story. Yet, the environmental turn is excluded, which may be seen in the two leading textbooks on the subject. And these are textbooks that are used in the US, Europe, and South Asia itself. And this is the state of affairs with modern South Asian history, even though environmental history of South Asia has been a thriving field since the early 1990s. As I said, the neglect of the environment stands in sharp contrast to the embrace by historians of other turns in the last 50 years. The social history turn of the 1960s still remains at the center of the discipline, although reconfigured by the linguistic and cultural critiques it has, that it has been subjected to. The gender turn has also dramatically reshaped the core of the discipline, as has the post-colonial. And more recently, the imperial and global turns have had a profound and widespread impact. Why have these turns succeeded where the environmental has failed? Now, this question can be answered in terms of the changing composition of the historical profession since the 1960s. The expansion of the university and broader access to higher education during the post-war boom, boom brought new groups into, into the discipline of history who served as carriers, so to speak, of new perspectives. Since the 1960s, young historians drawn from working class backgrounds, 
women and people of color, followed by the growing globalization of this, the discipline since the 1980s, brought in individuals who could push forward turns such as the social, gender, post-colonial, and imperial. By contrast, the natural world did not have any representatives in the ranks of the professoriate and was therefore the domain of merely the environmentally committed. Now, while such social developments are not trivial and cannot be neglected, they don't really explain the whole story, in my opinion. And the linguistic and cultural turns cannot be reduced to such identity factors for, um, for they too do not have representatives in the university, but nevertheless, the linguistic and cultural turn succeeded where the environmental turn did not. So I would argue that more compelling explanations for the failures of the environmental turn focus, to, to get these more compelling explanations, we need to focus on the theoretical grounds upon which these turns have made the case for their importance. And here, environmental history has failed to make a compelling case for the centrality of the natural world for understanding the past. In contrast to the turns discussed above, the environmental turn has not produced a powerful theoretical statement on the importance of its perspective for making sense of history as a whole. Environmental historians have not issued statements such as Eric Holmes' From Social History to the History of Society, which was published in 1970 in the journal Daedalus, or Joan Scott's Gender, a Useful Category for Historical Analysis, published in the American Historical Review in 1985. These classic essays made powerful theoretical arguments for the importance of the social and gender perspectives they championed. On the one hand, Hobsbawm's famous essay is an elaboration of a Marxian approach in which starting with social conditions, one can write a history of society as a whole. One starts with the material and historical environment, goes on to the forces and techniques of production, Hobsbawm wrote in that classic essay. But on the other hand, it is a powerful assertion of the centrality of the social dimension to the writing of history. And here, quoting again from Hobsbawm, the social or societal aspects of man's being cannot be separated from the other aspects of his being. They cannot for more than a moment be separated from the ways in which men get their living and their material environment. They cannot even for a moment be separated from their ideas since their relations with one another are expressed and formulated in language, which implies concepts as soon as they open their mouths. So as a consequence, all histories, whether they are economic, cultural, or intellectual, have a social component. Social history is not just a perspective on the past, the way economic history and intellectual history are, according to Hobsbawm. The social is indispensable for understanding every dimension of existence in past times. This is the reason that social history continues to be the bedrock of the historical discipline even today, despite the blistering critiques it has received at the hands of post-structuralist, cultural historians, and the linguistic turn. While the totalizing claims of social history have lost their luster, there's no denying the centrality of social relations to all domains of human activity. Scott makes an equally powerful case for the importance of gender for the writing of history because it is essential to the operation of power, she argued. Scott's well-known definition of gender has two parts. First, gender is a constitutive element of social relations based on perceived differences between the sexes. And, and second, gender is a primary way of signifying relations of power. These two, gen two, these two dimensions of gender are closely connected, but Scott finds it analytically useful to dis distinguish between them. While the first deals with the effect of gender in social and institutional relations, the second takes up the, the task of theorizing gender. In essence, Scott argues that ideas of masculine and feminine are enduring ways in which power is understood and articulated. She illustrates this claim with several examples drawn from the sphere of political power, partly because at the time she wrote the essay, political history had resisted an engagement with women and gender. And what could be more central to the task of historian than the understanding of power 
political and otherwise. While in her essay, Scott focused on this one domain of human activity, the use of gender has reshaped the writing of history more broadly. And in 2012, Rebecca Edwards wrote, gender history offers a set of lenses through which scholars in all subfields need to peer. Historians of laws, technology, and foreign relations, to name just a few, now routinely recognize gender as a category of analysis. Hobbes, Baum, and Scott put forward powerful theoretical claims that the social and gender perspectives, respectively, are critical for, critical for understanding history, no matter the particular focus or interest. Environmental history, however, has not given rise to such theoretical statements which assert the centrality of the natural world for the understanding of the past or for the writing of history. Even leading environmental historians are content to define the task of environmental history in descriptive terms. That is, in terms which neither explain the process of historical change or illuminate central categories in history. Donald Worcester defined the field as dealing with the interactions that societies in the past have had with the non-human world. A decade and a half later, John McNeil offered a strikingly similar definition in which environmental history was the history of the mutual relations between humankind and the rest of nature. For J. Donald Hughes, environmental history studies the mutual relationships of humans and nature through time. Now, the problem with these definitions is that they describe what environmental history does rather than offering new categories or rethinking existing ones in order to construct new approaches to history. The parallels between environmental history and women's history before the gender turn are striking. In women's history, Scott herself was struck by the discrepancy between the high quality of recent work and its continuing marginal status in the field as a whole. She argued that this gap pointed to the limits of descriptive approaches, which she argued characterized women's history, that do not address dominant disciplinary concepts. Non-feminist historians could dismiss the findings of women's historians as irrelevant to their concerns, just as non-environmental historians can acknowledge the importance of the natural world, but at the same time declare that it has nothing to do with what they are interested in, whether it is social life, intellectual endeavors, or cultural matters. Environmental historians have fa failed to formulate a response which shows the centrality of nature for an understanding of history as a whole or its importance as a category of historical analysis in the ways that I've described for social history and gender history. As a consequence, we have a historical discipline in which the bulk of its practitioners are not in a position to speak to the most pressing what to, are not in a position to speak to the most pressing, pressing issues of our day. Climate change, ecological overshoot, the sixth extinction, and other grave environmental dangers which we and the planet face. This paper provides a way out of this impasse. It, prevents, it presents a framework for putting the natural world at the center of the writing of history, for it argues that without nature, historians cannot understand time. And where is history without time? Time lies at the heart of what historians do. Other disciplines traffic in time, but for none is it absolutely central to the enterprise. At a minimum, time is needed to construct chronologies, create a sense of before and after, demarcate historical periods, and delineate an arc of historical development and change. Without time, we cannot speak of change or continuity. This is why Fernand Brodel wrote, the historian can never get away from the question of time in history. Time sticks to his thinking like soil to a gardener's spade. Despite its centrality to, to what they do, historians only rarely reflect on the category of time and its manifestations. Nearly 70 years after it was first put forward, Brodel's tripartite division of time still remains one of the most important statements. Brodel's three times moved at different rates. The most important for him was geographical, and its passage has almost been imperceptible, that of many in his relationship to the environment, a history in which all change is slow, a history of constant repetition, ever-recurring cycles. 
A second level of time, Brodel called social, and it was the history of groups and groupings. It possessed slow but, in, but perceptible rhythms and encompassed economic systems, states, societies, and civilizations. For Brodel, these social forces were exemplified at times of warfare, an arena not governed purely by individual responsibilities. The final time for him was, was that of traditional history. History, one might say, on the scale not of man, but of individual men. This is the history of events, surface disturbances, crests of foam that the tides of history carry on their strong backs. Environmental historians have rightly criticized Brodel for assuming that the natural world exists in a state of near immobility. And this is really one of the most important sites of the environmental turn, that nature does change and at times very rapidly. And what was long taken to be pristine nature is actually the product of human activities going back many millennia. Second nature, in William Cronin's turn of phrase. Well, environmental historians, though, have less to say about two other problematic elements of the Brodellian approach. First, that approach creates a hierarchy of time, giving greater weight to the longer temporal dimension of geographical time in which change is very slow at all. Or very slow, if at all. However, as the emergence of the Anthropocene has shown, geographical time has itself been transformed by human activity. So why should, human, why should geographical time be given priority, if this is the case? A second problem with the Brodellian approach is that it sees these three levels of time as discrete and together forming a total history. But there's little exploration of how these three levels are mutually constitutive. For example, how does the time of geography shape the social time of economies, polities, and civilizations, and vice versa? Now, I believe that Reinhard Koselleck provides a way out of these Brodellian dilemmas. Koselleck shares with Brodell a belief in multiple historical temporalities, but for him, they are not discrete, but rather overlie one another. Koselleck focuses on two, what he calls natural time and historical time. Historical time is tied to social and political units of action, to particular acting and suffering human beings, and to their institutions and organizations. In Brodellian terms, historical time takes in both social and individual time. It is the time of humans and their actions and institutions. For Kasselik, natural time is based on the rhythms of our planet and solar system, including the rotation of the Earth around its axis the and the revolutions of the moon around our planet, and our planet around the sun, as well as the succession of biological generations. And these natural temporalities are the basis for our chronologies. I mean, without the movement of our planet around the sun, we can, cannot speak of years. As Koselleck observes, history cannot be written without chronologies. Therefore, the time of nature is essential for the writing of history. The intimate connection between natural and historical time leads to a conclusion, and here I'm quoting from Koselleck, that appears to be banal, Koselleck wrote, but is really fundamental. Natural time, with its recurrence and its time limits, is a permanent premise both of history and of its interpretation as an academic discipline. This paper builds upon the Koselleckian approach and shares with him his twofold division of time. It sees natural time as the rhythms of nature, both those that give us chronologies, and here I'm expanding beyond Koselleck's approach to natural time, because it's not only about chronologies, but it's also about the many rhythms of our planet that make life possible. Historical time consists of the actions that men and women have undertaken signal, singly and in groups, the knowledge that they have amassed and the institutions that they have built, maintained, and at times torn down. Now, I accept the hierarchy of time found in Brodel, for historical time is a subset of natural time, given that humans are a part of nature. At the same time, though, Historical time and natural time overlie one another, so they kind of lie on top of each other and interact as they are profoundly connected. While the temporalities of nature give shape to historical time, the actions of humans have reshaped the times of nature, most strikingly in the Anthropocene, in which human activity has dra dramatically transformed our planet systems. <clears throat> 
So as I said, this paper, this conception of nature's time, encompasses more than just Catholics and sees it as more than the rotation of the Earth, the revolutions of the moon and our planet, and the succession of biological generations. Koselleck focused on only one aspect of natural time, and a particularly crucial one, the time of astronomy and physics. But this is only one of a multitude of different natural times that, to borrow and rephrase Immanuel Kant, formed the conditions of possibility for any historical experience. From brain synapses to fruit flies to volcanoes to seasons to the speed of light, nature has many temporalities. The te and these temporalities not are not only the source of chronologies, but shape and condition historical time. For millennia, the growth rate of trees determined the heat energy that was available to humans. The mating rhythms of animals from deer on the land to fish in the sea shaped human migration, hunting and fishing in this diet. The movement of the sun and the coming of the rains informed the agrarian calendar and shaped the development of mathematics and astronomy. And so for thousands of years, natural temporalities of the sort have shaped human life and our ancestors relied upon them for survival on this planet. Every region of the world is subject to its own natural temporalities and these vary with geography, climate, and of course, human activity. For nature is not pristine. As seen strikingly in the 12,000 years of the Holocene, nature is the product of human actions, ranging from the setting of fires to the cutting of trees, the creation of agriculture, the damming of rivers, and on and on and on. And this is one of the great insights of half a century of writings in environmental history. And just as humans have shaped natural time, nature has shaped historical time. For humans have created institutions, formulated strategies, and adopted rhythms to adjust and live with and live with the temporality of the natural world as they experienced and understood it. So it's both experience and understanding. And of course, historical temporalities can be multiple as institutions have longer time horizons than individuals. Even in the best of times, the, the temporalities of nature and, and history fit together uneasily, but in bad times, whether due to human actions or natural changes, the mismatch is attenuated and crises are possible. The resolution to these crises creates new conditions and new possibilities. To ignore the natural dimension of, histor of historical time is to fall prey to a conceit of modernity, which is that the temporality of history stands apart from that of the natural world. Koselleck links the separation of humans from nature to the mechanization of timekeeping and to the shrinking proportion of the population devoted to agriculture. While he devotes the bulk of his, of his attention to developments in time measurement, he does note that the changing of the seasons shaped everyday life and farming cultures, that this, but that this has become less important with the decline in the food producing sector, which now amounts to fewer than 10% of the employees within our society. As a consequence of these shifts, Koselleck concludes that in modernity, history is a process freed of imminent forces, no longer simply deductible from natural conditions and hence no longer adequately explained in their terms. The element, of, the dynamic of the modern is established as an element, sui generi, Koselleck concludes. So the modern denaturalization of time coincided with the denaturalization of history. However, the divorce between natural and, and historical time I argue is an illusion, for we have not lost our connection to a natural temporality, we've simply replaced one temporality with another, one natural temporality with another natural temporality. We may be less tied to the rhythms of agriculture, but the energy that we consume every day is a testimony to our continued con connection to the times of the natural world. We have exchanged the temporality of trees for that of fossil fuels, but anthropogenic climate change and the new temporalities of nature that it has sparked is revealing our modern separation from nature to be illusory. Time is the central category for historians, and with the approach sketched above, nature is brought into the center of writing, uh, into the center of the writing of history. Historians can now move from general calls to integrate humans in nature, which 
environmental historians have been issuing for decades, to the specific relationship between natural time and historical time and the ways in which the temporalities of nature shape those of history and vice versa. And it's my contention that such an approach to time must transform historical practice as a whole. Now, in the, what I do now in the, in the written text, which I will not subject to all of it to you, um, I illustrate this approach to time with three examples. The first is the Little Ice Age of the 17th century. Um, and the question deals with the question of why Mughal India was so much more successful than other parts of the world um, during the crisis of the 17th century. And this is a problem that Jeffrey Parker deals with. Uh, the, the third example has to do with the Anthropocene. Um, but I'm going to talk about the second example from the paper, and that has to do with the introduction of fossil fuel technologies into 19th century Tamil Nadu. So hopefully what I've given you rather abstractly, I hope, is, can be more grounded now. In colonial Tamil Nadu, so this is in the 19th century, the temporalities of both nature and history were transformed with the introduction of fossil fuel technologies. And here I use the term technologies rather than fossil fuels deliberately. And the reasons for this will be evident shortly. The key technologies of this transformation were the steam engine in the 19th century and oil and diesel pumps uh, starting in the early 20th century. Steam engines were used in Tamil Nadu from at least the 1830s, and from the mid-19th century, they began to be used on a wider scale with the construction of railways and the establishment of textile mills, which utilized steam power. In much of the world, the adoption of steam engines was closely connected to the, gro to the growing exploitation of coal. In 18th century Britain, the world's leader in fossil fuels, steam and coal were intimately linked. Uh, because early steam engines were inefficient, they were most profitably run at coal mines where plentiful supplies of cheap fuel made it feasible to run the engines, which were used to pump water from the mine shafts. This link continued as steam engines became more efficient and they were fueled by coal power to, uh, by coal to power machines and pull wagons on rails. The steam coal complex was critical for creating the hallmark conditions of modernity. modernity. It made possible the speeding up of time, all that a solid melts into air, in the vivid words of Marx and Engels. Steam engines made it possible to run machinery faster than was possible with human, animal, or water power. Steam engines revolutionized transport, making possible the railway, which led not only to the compression of time, but also of space. Fossil fuels and fossil fuel technology created a new relationship between the temporalities of nature and history. With fossil fuels, the energy available to humans and thus the pace of activity was no longer set by the rate of photosynthesis. This is captured in Tony Wrigley's distinction between organic and mineral economies. In a mineral or fossil fuel economy, uh, fossil fuel economy supplies of, of energy are not limited by the length of time it takes for trees to grow, which was the case in an organic economy. This shift made possible the modern myth that humans had broken the limits of nature. However, the Anthropocene, which maybe we can take up in question and answers, has shown that this divorce between the temporalities of history and nature is really illusory. Now, the introduction of steam engines had a dramatically different impact in Tamil Nadu than in Europe. In Germany, for example, these engines were powered by coal, and they were part of a larger rise of coal-based production, and which preserved and, in some cases, even enlarged forests. In Tamil Nadu, steam engines were fueled exclusively by wood in the 19th century. From approximately 1915, coal began to be introduced, but wood continued to power railways till well after Indian independence in 1947. And I still remember as a child in the 1960s seeing steam engines being run fueled by, coal, uh, by wood. Now, the steam engine's voracious demand for fuel led to the decimation of forests in Tamil Nadu. This mixing of fossil fuel technology with organic fuel had important implications. First, the time of modernity continued to be linked to an organic economy in Tamil Nadu. 
Although railways compressed space and time, they were not fully divorced from the temporality of trees, whose, whose growth rate shaped their operation. And in the second half of the 19th century, the British spent a lot of time trying to figure out how they could get fuel and maintain the fuel supplies for these railways. So plantation, forestry, all kinds of things. Now, this mixture of a, a fossil fuel technology with an organic source of energy I call biosteam power. Now, biosteam power created a mismatch between natural and historical temporalities. With the steam engine, the rate of demand for wood came to far exceed, came to far exceed the rate of growth of trees, which led to shortages of wood, higher energy prices for peasants, and working people. By the late 19th century, the, the high cost of wood became so acute that the government recommended that firewood should be distributed as part of famine relief. Because of what was the use of distributing uncooked rice and dal and so on if the recipients couldn't cook this stuff because they didn't have access to fuel. In the span of several decades, the bio-steam economy exhausted the rich energy supplies of the region. Now, this mismatch of temporalities also emerged with water, again as a consequence of the introduction of fossil fuel technologies. While the process was set in motion in the late 19th century, the mismatch became apparent only many decades later. Between 1865 and 1900, Tamil Nadu was hit by a wave of famines, the most severe being the Madras famine of 1876 to 1878. These crises were sparked by unusually prolonged dry weather and a failure of monsoonal rains due to intense El Nino activity. But this must be balanced with the collapse of, with the collapse of long-standing political institutions, knowledge, and strategies to cope with and recover from such crises. And a lot of these institutions and strategies were made less possible by the British because they were costly and because they ran counter to the Smithian free market principles which shaped their economic as well as famine policies. After the Madras famine of 1876-78, colonial agricultural experts concluded that since the famine was sparked by the failure of the monsoons, the only way to make agriculture secure was to rely upon wells which could tap underground stores of water. In the early 19th century, the bulk of agriculture in Tamil Nadu relied upon irrigation as opposed to being purely rain-fed. And there were three forms of irrigation. First, river water was diverted directly to fields by a system of canals. Second, tanks, and these were storage facilities for water, whether rainwater, river water, um, dotted the countryside. Some of them were really massive, like 10 miles by 3 miles in size, 30 square miles in size. And these stored uh, rain and river water and then released them for irrigation as needed. Um, and riverine systems of irrigation and these, this tank irrigation each accounted for about 40% of irrigated area in Tamil Nadu. Now the final, the third and final form of irrigation um, which watered about 20% of irrigation of irrigated land was wells. And these relied upon tapping underground reserves of water. Now the temporality of river and tank irrigation systems meshed with the annual cycle of the monsoon. Well irrigation departed from that rhythm and, replied, and relied upon water sources that were filled over a period of years, decades, centuries, millennia, and perhaps even longer. So the British policy after the famine of 1876 to 78 to expand well digging had profound implications for the relationship between the temporalities of nature and that of history. While well digging expanded in the late 19th century, that expansion was limited because of the high costs of lifting water, which demanded substantial human or animal power. The British were seeking to link irrigation to a different temporality of nature, that stemming from underground water supplies as opposed to the monsoon, but those efforts were limited by the energy constraints that the organic economy imposed. These constraints were broken in the early 20th century with the introduction of oil pumps, which relied upon fossil fuels to more cheaply and effectively lift water. Later in the century, oil pumps were superseded by electric and then even later diesel pumping systems. <clears throat> 
The expansion of well irrigation in the 20th century established a whole new cropping uh, whole, established whole new cropping regimes and calendars and schedules as the agricultural year was no longer shaped by the timing and extent of the monsoon. Agriculture was unmoored from a long-standing temporality of nature. That unmooring was also to be its undoing as there was now a mismatch between the time of nature and that of history. The temporalities of Humans had overtaken nature's time, and underground water systems in Tamil Nadu today are being exhausted as a consequence. And there are areas of Tamil Nadu where the drilling of new wells has been totally banned. The introduction of fossil fuel technologies, as well as fossil fuels, reshaped both humans and nature in colonial Tamil Nadu. Human time was sped up and came to exceed that of nature. At the same time, hybrid forms were introduced. The steam engine compressed time, but was still linked to the temporality of an organic economy. Water pumping devices divorced agriculture, the quintessential manipulation of nature and thus bound to it from the fundamental natural timekeeper of Tamil Nadu, the monsoon. The mismatch between the time of history and that of nature, which was, which was introduced in the 19th century, poses serious threats to humans, not only in Tamil Nadu, but throughout the world. So let me conclude. Eric Holmesbaum and Joan Scott made their social and gender lenses indispensable for every historian, working in any field, teaching any period or any kind of history. The lens of nature is no less indispensable, as this paper has argued, for the temporalities of nature are essential to historical time. Time is at the heart of history. Without time, how can we distinguish past from present, or the deep past from that which is more near, or most critically, chart change and continuity, which unfold over time? Since the time of history contains a natural dimension, no historian can neglect the natural world. For while historians for whom nature did not appear relevant could ignore environmental history, which defined its task as charting the mutual relations between humankind and the rest of nature, no historian can ignore the temporalities of nature because they shape historical time itself. The temporalities of nature are many. And in the broader paper with all three examples, um, the paper dealt with fluctuations in climate, the growth of trees, the accumulation of underground water, the formation of fossil fuels, changes in the composition of our atmosphere, the time, but the time of nature is defined by, by much more. From the lifespan of insects, whether mosquitoes or fleas, to the half-life of uranium, the speed of growth of bacteria, the rate of decomposition of various human-made objects, nature's time shapes and conditions human institutions and actions, in other words, historical time. For the historian of the state, the Little Ice Age shows that the temporalities of climate play a role in the actions of rulers and the emergence of state institutions. For the historian of economic life, the introduction of fossil fuel technology demonstrated that economic activity both shapes and reshapes the time of nature. And for the historian of modernity, the Anthropocene reveals that our modern age is simultaneously indebted to and fundamentally reshaped the, re the deep temporalities of nature. The historian of religion is indebted to the temporalities of nature, which informed rituals, pilgrimages, and holy days. The history of science and mathematics has been shaped by need to understand nature's time. The history of the family is immersed in the time of nature, as are the histories of disease, medicine, labor, work, warfare, and urbanization. Reinhard Koselleck concluded that the natural time prerequisites of our lives can never be eliminated. Rather, they have our own, their own history. Having ignored this, we have put humans and the planet in peril. Historians must reject the conceit of modernity, modernity that humans are divorced from nature and join the struggle to redefine what it means to be human. Recognizing the natural dimensions of historical time will be an important step in that journey. Thank you. Thank you, Prasanna, for this uh, broad uh, and wide-ranging paper. Now, talking about time, we have our time is 40 minutes, uh, and that's the time that we have for questions. And I would like to um, kick off while you start thinking about your questions by um, asking you, Prasanna, you, you make a case that in order to support a turn, you have to have three ingredients. <laughs> 
you need to, you need to have a champion. Perhaps you might be uh, the champion of the environmental term. You need to have a case. Uh, and this was for social history, really about social relations. Uh, for gender history, is really about power. And in your case, is you claim that your, your, your case um, mode is about time for environmental history. But you need also a third element. You need actually people who like your message uh, in order to be successful. And I wonder, I mean, there are several questions uh, related to this. One is the ways in which you might define time not as a descriptive category, but as an analytical category, and that's one big issue in the sense that a lot of definitions of time are more descriptive than analytical. But to me, the second issue related to um, how whether the people are there to embrace your ideas relate to the issue of agency. Because the other terms are characterized by the fact that the end result was a broadening of agency, whether to include women specifically, whether to include society more broadly rather than just the elites and so on. But your case, in somewhat, is more ambivalent on that. I see it as more ambivalent in the sense that rather than the broadening of anthropocentric agency, there seems to be somewhat of a reduction of it or a rediscussion that is very present in the constant of the Anthropocene, in which you become perverse, in which the agency of humans come to destroy the very artifacts of humans, that is to say the world that we inhabit. So I would like to start to kicking off by asking you to move from, if you want, the realm of uh, the academic to the realm more of, uh, you might say, of the policy maker. So as if you were trying to convince that we truly need this turn and the truly time is the way to go for it. And what are we do, going to do with agency of humans in all of this? Sorry, it's a broad ranging question. Then I will try to capture people. Giorgio, I take back what I said at the beginning. <laughs> We're not a true friend with a question like that. I mean, that's such a huge question. I, mean, I don't know about policymakers. But it's. I mean, I think what are the, I mean, the big issue that we face is how do we how do we think about ourselves in in a different way in, in this moment of, of crisis. And um, perhaps I mean, what the Anthropocene does is it, it highlights the incredible power of humans and human activity. And, and I suppose what part of what rethinking our place on the planet requires a, a, a greater modesty on our part as humans. And perhaps part of that is, is reducing the kind of agency that we have. Um, now, I'm not sure. And when you look at Joan Scott's essay, it actually, there is no agency. I mean, it's, it's a post-structuralist inspired argument. So it, she was writing against women's history that was trying to expand agency. So I'm not, sh I'm not convinced that we need to expand agency in order to get more adherence. But certainly I agree that um, we need people to accept a message. And I think the first message is that we, that they have to accept is that we do need to think of ourselves differently on this planet. And then I would argue that Time is one pl uh, possible way historians can begin that process. Yes, thanks so much, Blessing, and for such an inspiring talk. It's been particularly inspiring uh, to me because um, you addressed the problem of time, which I've been delving into from a different, more Anthropocene restricted perspective, not so universally as you do approach the problem from the perspective of the writing of history. Um, I, you know, I was thinking about the environmental turn and why I never felt totally comfortable with the term 
environmental turn itself. Um, and I started thinking about it because I just recently got an invitation to a conference by a German um, literary studies professor to a conference which, call, which is called The Anthropocene Turn? Question mark. And I thought, how can the Anthropocene be a turn? Just one more turn, which we de deal with in a very fashionable way for the next 10 years, and then put aside. It kind of doesn't fit. And I think you also gave kind of, or indirectly, and I wonder if that's what that was your intention, an, an answer to, to that question that you even didn't rise. Why the, I mean, you rose it in the beginning, asking why there was never a, seriously, uh, uh, never a seriously successful environmental turn with, in our recent historiography. And I think the answer you gave by very nicely illustrating how much natural time is involved in our basic understanding of time, not just historical time, any time we're thinking about as human beings, which also goes beyond the discipline, um, that actually the universality of the environment and the universality, the continuing universality um, of our relationships with the environment and its meaning in 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 understanding his, uh, the, the affairs we're dealing with, human hist affairs uh, in history and the writing of history, is precisely why this is not a turn. It is the subconscious coming upwards and coming back to mind. And a lot of our colleagues and historians are seeing this, particularly those who are not environmental historian, historians, as I think, as a threat. Environmental historians are a threat to the uh, discipline of history because there's a danger, or some see it that way, I've heard that in open conversation, that it, environmental historians, and particularly climate historians, you know, discussions such as the Anthropocene is just another uh, dimension on, on top of it as a, as a way to colonize the discipline. Um, now, I wonder, uh, do you think that's an exaggerated view or an over-interpretation of your <laughs> intentions? Uh, or I guess I'm, I'm curious to know your uh, well, summary perspective uh, on that. I mean, first of all, on the language of turns, I suppose that was a kind of literary device that I used because I started with that American Historical Review Forum on turns and it was really struck. And, and a turn can be enduring in the social history turn is certainly, I mean, we're going on close to 60 years. So I don't think it means something that's kind of illusory and will go away after it's run its course. Um, and I mean, the linguistic and cultural turn, I mean, they've shaped historical practices across the field. And, and, and I think to very good effect in, in lots of cases. So I think these things can be enduring, and I, and I agree with you. I mean, I think about the importance of environmental history. I don't see it as just something oh, that we should dabble with now. Um, but I think we need to figure out how to make a case to historians as a whole. And um, my experience in the United States is not that people are hostile to environmental history. Um, and I should also say, I, mean, it's, I was trained as an economic historian, as Georgia said, um, and I've come to environmental history just in the last 10 years out of various interests that have developed and also from finding things in the archives that just kind of blew me away. I mean, I, I didn't realize until several years ago that large areas of Tamil Nadu were forested well into the 19th century. I mean, there's no evidence of forests there at all now. And all, and all these things started to make sense. And it's not something that's in any historical account. Um, but coming to it, I, I was just struck at the marginalization of these things. And um, I became, I was on leave for a year, a few years ago, and then I came back to my department. And I was feeling very unhappy. And I felt like, I said to one of my colleagues, I mean, what good is a discipline where almost all of the practitioners can't address the two, the two most important issues of our day, climate change and inequality? And the inequality speaks to the decline of economic history. 
and the environmental and the climate change is just the marginalization of environmental history. So, I, but we can't just go to our colleagues and say, oh, you should all, you should just start doing environmental history. And so the purpose of this paper is really to say, let us all approach history with a different starting, from a different starting point. And time, we, if you're a historian, you must deal with time. I mean, I, I, I still define history the way Mark Bloch did, as, as the science of change. So for that, you need time. Or I love Hobsbawm's definition also from the history of human, humanity or humans from the Paleolithic to the nuclear age. And so, so this is really an attempt to get people to think from the ground up differently. And I think a lot of historians in my, at least in the US, I think there's a lot of concern. They don't, historians who are not trained as environmental historians don't know how to teach the stuff, how to include it. We, we don't have textbooks in which the environmental narrative is integrated with the political, social, cultural, and economic. It's brought in in an ad hoc manner, if it's brought in at all. So there's a lot of work that environmental historians needed to do and should have done, rather than creating a new subfield. They should have been thinking about how do we transform historical practices as a whole. And, and they didn't do that. They were happy talking to each other, which they do in their conferences. But and Richard White, I had a conversation with him several years ago, and he said, I've stopped going to the environmental history meetings in the United States because they're just talking to the true believers. So how do we, this is my attempt, and maybe it might flop, but I'm willing to try. But I don't see the same hostility. I mean, I think there's, that, that you, you, you identified here, maybe in Germany or somewhere else. That, that anthrop climate change, Anthropocene, all this is an attempt at colonization of the discipline as a whole. So environmental historian among you, beware. We have another question. Thank you so much for this very interesting talk. As an art historian and someone who has recently whole-scale whole apprenticed myself to the environmental humanities, I'm a little baffled by the description that you give, and I wonder if you could be a historian of history. In other words, is history simply an incredibly conservative discipline as it is bureaucratically managed in the academy? Because from two drawers over, the third essay would be Deepesh Chakrabarti's Theses of History, you know, mm -hmm. the climate of history. I mean, that is huge in the environmental humanities. Literary studies, media studies, art history, eco-art, I mean, everyone refers to this as a crucial polemic that precisely deals with deep time. And in fact, footnotes, Paolo you know, Rossi's abyss of time, and so on and so forth. So I'm, I'm fascinated that this isn't one in the pantheon and that this work is not already embraced and organizing history itself. So, you know, the, the bookshelves of environmental humanities that I just had to pack up and ship away, I mean, you know, four by six, right? Hundreds of books. So where is history? Is it simply a hidebound conservative discipline that cannot flexibly engage with the anthropologies of the, you know, I mean, multi-species ethnography, I mean, deep time analyses that are hitting art history. I, so for me, this is a fascinating portrait of a discipline that is almost behind what it itself has done for the environmental humanities. It's a difficult question. I mean, from where I'm sitting, um, I mean, I think, I don't know how, how widely that essay is read by historians. I, maybe some of the other historians. I mean, I, I, I've taught it a number of times and so on. I know Giorgio teaches it to his undergraduates at Warwick. But I don't, 
I don't see it as a kind of a staple. I mean, I think his provincializing Europe has actually probably taught more these days than his the climate of history, the four theses, which, I mean, that this paper that I just gave you has been very inspired by that essay. So I think there are people out there, and there is a small, I mean, there are a small number of historians who are interested in the Anthropocene. Um, even environmental historians are there. The hostility to the Anthropocene that I've seen actually doesn't come from historians as a general. It comes from environmental historians in the U.S. They see it as colonizing their little subfield and trying to subvert it in some way. So um, I, I don't think... It, about a year ago, the American Historical Review approached me about participating in a forum on climate change and history and Anthropocene. I don't, I haven't seen anything happen from that. And I don't know if it's a conservative and hidebound discipline. I'm not sure I would say call it that. But it, it, it for whatever reason, it has not engaged with questions around climate change, and I can't. I can't answer why. Maybe some of the other historians in the room have their thoughts on this. We have another question, and then we might go back to this. Okay. Conservatism. Well, actually, um, so I work at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and your characterization is completely unlike the the experience that I've had. So. Um, I was in the history of science department that just folded into the history department, so it's been my first year in the history department, and um, and I'm uh, blown away by you know not surprisingly because Bill Cronin is there and yeah. Greg Mittman who's done a lot of work to to um, you know bridge history, history of science, and environmental history, um, and also. Um, having been at the, our Humanities Institute for the last four years, I'm glad you made the comment you did about environmental humanities because I see that as a way in, back into history that I think, you know, once the humanities as, I mean, it's just everywhere. And so, but I think there might be something to this point about the, um, entrenched thing, uh, aspects of, of, of um, different aspects of history. And I'm not sure that temporality is the way in. And this was actually the question or the comment that I was going to mm -hmm. make. Because, I mean, I really liked what you were doing of trying to, to um, uh, talk about the interactions of different levels of temporality, because I think that's really interesting. But if you take it really seriously, you move pretty fast to a level of complexity where only a complexity theorist can really manage it. And then it becomes, I mean, the, the history that I've read by complexity theorists are, is really boring. It doesn't include any human agency because the, uh, the, the um, individual action and institutional action becomes so epiphenomenal on the deeper levels of history. And so I find that a very frustrating direction, and I see that as a, a, a direction that the implications of your talk seem to go in that direction, and that kind of bothers me, so I wonder if you have comments about that. Well, I haven't read any of this history by complexity theorists. Who, who are some of the, the people who, who write in this? I'm going to... Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean. But big history is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a fan of big history. Yeah. I mean, but as I, I mean, what I tried to, the example that I gave you, uh, from 19th century South India. I mean, there's certainly human act, act, activity in there, and I think that's really important for me as a historian, and I'm certainly inspired by, I, mean, I think human agency is important in shaping the world. Um, and I think as an economic historian, I would say we can do this kind of history without making it 
turning it into something that we, we don't recognize and having it driven purely by structural or institutional forces. Uh, that's one thing. And I don't know. I mean, the environmental humanities might affect history, but it may not. I mean, it will be interesting to see. But uh, my, my view is we should be trying all kinds of different approaches and let's see what, if something actually sticks. And I think, I actually think temp time is, re is one promising uh, way to try to get historians to, to think harder because they're perfectly happy reading the Mediterranean and saying, oh yeah, Brodell has kind of laid it out for us. But it's, surprised, it's just shocking how little historians actually think about it at the end of the day. And maybe it, it, it may not stick. This is what I've come up with. And I, everybody else should come up with something else, whatever they have. And let's see if we can move this thing. And I'm glad to hear that Madison is totally different. I mean, and I'm sure part of it is Cronin's impact. Um, but even Cronin, I mean, it's, I mean, Nature's Metropolis is this classic book. And people, I and mean, I think a lot of American historians read it for their PhDs and all of these things, but it, I'm not sure to what extent then it, re, it shapes how they think about things when they do their own research, unless they're doing environmental history. Thank you very much. I'm still thinking about how to formulate my question after these questions and how it can f uh, fill in. So. I'm trying to bring things together that you were saying about general history, about which I, as a historian of technology, science and medicine, I think cannot really say much because I'm not even sure what is the f general field of history nowadays. But let's say, like, what are the many perspectives of looking at history in general? And I'm thinking about your question about what is the conceptual value of environment and thus also the environmental turn. And when you link that to time, then uh, immediately I think a bunch of really difficult issues come up. So what you consider to be time and temporality would be for me as a historian of technology also the discrepancy of different perceptions of probably not so much time but the velocity of things, yeah, or the t velocity by which you perceive things or produce things or use things or consume things and as an economic historian I'm quite sure you know all these things pretty well and I see that in your talk you are really when you come from the environmental perspective and you give this this materiality of the environment an agency then it's actually where this velocity rather than the time or the temporality actually matters. So when I try to formulate that into a question, then I wonder how, how you can ask the historian to act differently and why this is not just simply pushing them into a field that they are not very comfortable with because they are text historians. So it's very difficult for a text historian to deal with the issue of what does it mean to think about the environment or as a historian of technology for instance I'm asking myself every day this question when I have an artifact think about Apaturai the social life of artifacts what kind of knowledge is in it how long is it there who can perceive it how does it revert back how does it produce other kind of knowledge how do I think about the different temporalities or velocities of the things or the way of producing things and the way in which humans deal with that as memory, as reception, as regimes of attention or things like that. And, and thus I'm wondering, like, I think the simple question that stands behind that, like, are you asking the historians to, to move away from texts? Is that basically at, back, at the back of asking them to be more serious about time? Or are you asking them to think more about what it means to include, like, I have no better word for it, materiality or material agency or like, like ontological considerations into it? For, let me first take up the question of velocity. And, but I mean, velocity, velocity is defined as rate of change or movement over time. So we need time to even speak about velocity. 
thought about. So that's that's a t- that's, so there's temporality there. And I'm, I'm certainly not trying to tell historians whether to move away from texts or to do this thing or that thing. But I think to approach their texts or whatever their sources may be, whether it's objects, um, in maybe in some different ways, asking different questions and maybe really thinking about what they're interpreting in some different ways with this different approach to time. You don't, you don't look satisfied. <laughs> I think there are more questions, but just to, to mention one thing, is if you, if you take this, this question of what you were describing in the Indian realm uh, uh, as a thing, then this is something that historians of technology are dealing with quite a lot, and historians of science, and I think also environmental studies are dealing with quite mm-hmm. a lot. And I would say that in the paradigm of modernity, more and more people, while moving to the 19th and 20th century, don't want to discuss about this acceleration or the discrepancy about like, like uh, things being produced and things being used and consumed. That's definitely something I think that needs more historical research. Mm-hmm. But does time as a like and the, the coupling with environment then help you to make that more obvious? I think so, but I mean it's the proof. We'll see. It. I mean, if this paper ever sees the light of day and gets published, and if people read it and then apply it. I mean, I give examples based on my own research and my own interests. And ho- hopefully other people will do the same and apply it in some other context and some other temporalities. We have quite a few questions, so we have a general there, and there's a couple of questions over there. I, uh, funnily enough, my question was very similar to the one just asked, because um, I think that maybe it comes down to a methodological issue, and I'm wondering uh, how this plays into certain like synergies or demarcations between other disciplines of time, like archaeology, paleoanthropology, and things like this, and I'm wondering, especially because there seems to be a new deployment of uh, methodologies that are more forensic or about material science, mm-hmm. um, if that can, if there's a something to be learned in the discipline of history that has traditionally used a lot of um, uh, text, etc., and source material in this way, if there's maybe synergies that could be um, brought together there, and maybe if that's a more affirmative methodological inroad to this epistemological problem. Well, I mean, I think historians have, have really are changing rapidly in terms of. The kinds of sources that they're using. I mean, Giorgio is an example of this. I mean, material culture is really central to a lot of historical practices now. Archaeology, and one of my colleagues, Robin Fleming, has been uh, produced a book on the history of post-Roman Britain, based entirely on archaeological evidence. So, very, and there are very few texts. So, I think the the discipline itself has broadened a lot in terms of its sources. Now, I, I'm not sure, I may be missing something, but I'm not sure how my argument dictates a certain type of source use, which both of these questions um, point to. But I don't see my argument. It's really a, a question about thinking about... Um, about time differently, and that can be done with archaeological evidence, with distant studying the distant past, studying the more, more contemporary history. I mean, I think it, I'll leave it at that. I mean, just really quick, I think that because I, I, I understand it as an epistemological problem, because you necessarily discredit these sort of <clears throat> environmental factors and material factors in one's historical account. If, you don't have a way of accessing those materials within the frame of your study. Mm -hmm. So necessarily, um, it strikes me that it is a methodological question. What what is the common toolbox for the consensus historian that's perhaps blinding them to seeing the the absolute necessity 
of environment uh, within their understanding of history. And if we, if we do assume that it is a necessity epistemologically. Well. It's back to the conservatism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I don't see it for, I actually don't see it as an epistemological issue. I mean, to me, it's really an ontological issue. I mean, how do we understand humans in the world and how do we understand time? So I don't think it's, I don't think historians have been limited, if they're ignoring environmental questions in the past. It's not because of the lack of sources. I think it's just because of the kinds of issues that they've been focused on, the kinds of questions they're, they're interested in, um, that has put off, created these blinders. And so, I mean, my example, I mean, the, this environmental turn that I experienced, I mean, it, I went into the archives several years ago in South India, planning a kind of agrarian history of 19th century South India. And then I sort of finding materials in the archives and sort of that I'd never imagined. So the archival materials for lots of places can be quite rich, but it's approaching them with a different eye. We're going to prompt you later about, is it just the archives or what kind of other sources you might have used in your specific example, but I'm not going to ask that, but it's mentioning it. So we have two questions. So. Okay, thank you very much for your talk. Um, similar questions, Dagmar, but not about historians in general. Do you also actually think it's a prerequisite for this environmental turn to have a turn within environmental history itself because it's such a broad field and there have been all these discussions, you know, or cultural environmental historians, actual environmental historians and the heart core material historian, uh, environmental historians. Um, and then the debate, I don't know, which is White's debate of like work and play and so on. So do you think only once environmental history has in itself kind of a clear methodology and method that this is, and then a manifesto on top of that, um, that other historians can pick that up? Or do you think they can offer something and say, well, even if we don't, not everyone says or writes explicitly about time, you other guys should pick up on this, and that's what we basically provide you as a different perspective. And the second thing I wanted to say is environmental historians, of course, like to hang out with each other because we're so much fun, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think it would be great if environmental historians picked up some of these ideas and actually tried, tried to engage with the broader discipline in whatever way they can. But I'm really interested in changing other historians and getting them to think differently. And, and this may not be the case in Germany, but in the U.S., a lot of us also teach. So I think if, if it changes actually the, um, the ways we can, if we can change the way we teach some of our survey classes, for instance, I think that will have an, a, a bigger impact than in, at least in the short run. So I think it's, it's really trying to think about history holes really from the ground up in, a, in some different ways. Oh, um, so, uh, thanks so much. This was a, um, a very provocative talk, and uh, I'm not sure if I'll phrase myself correctly. Um, in some ways, I'm actually, I actually think I'm picking up, but perhaps not, on both the environmental humanities questions, but also the previous question in that corner over there, um, which mentioned other fields that deal with time. Um, so, as I was thinking about this issue, it, it actually struck me that you potentially undersell um, the, the radicalness of your point. And so I'm simply going to rephrase some things I think have been said, but maybe in a more political manner. Is that, so you undersell your point possibly by retreating back into the discipline of history, which is actually where you don't need to go back into in some sense. Um, 
uh, because it, uh, what you have potentially is something that is much more expansive than, than just a retreat back into historians and historical practice. Um, so I might phrase this as a question that asks um, more broadly about this question of climate change is, do you actually think the modern disciplinary apparatus itself, so this, let's just say roughly arising in the 19th century, is something that is adequate as knowledge formation to deal with climate change, or does climate change itself necessitate a radical reorientation of the fields of knowledge as we know them and their relationships to one another, of which history is only one small part. Right. And just to give an example of this, I mean, if you were a little more historicist about your concept of history itself, and you go back before the 18th century, you'd find that historia is, is not about a temporal concept of history, per se. It's about many different forms of empirical observation and learned sources together that are combined with eyewitnessing that are more than just a, a time-based narrative. So I, I, basically, the larger question is the realignment of these, of these knowledge forms, uh, rather than just sticking to history, um, which I think your temporalization concept with nature can do in actually in radical ways that... Um, um, you don't push. Um, so you could be doing much more, is basically my point. I'm wondering what you think about that. No, oh, thank you. Um, no, I think, I, I think we need to do, we need radical reformulation of how we think about things. And I don't think these 19th century, 18th, 19th century, even 20th century um, frameworks are adequate today. I mean, and I, I, I suppose that's partly what I'm trying to do here in the context of the writing of history. And, and one of my colleagues keeps telling me, you need to go back and I mean, kind of think about how before the 18th century, there was no distinction between history and natural history, human history and natural history, and kind of bring that back. And, and I have resisted going there, but maybe I shouldn't. But it, it just feels like that's not where this paper should, should go. But it is... I, I appreciate your comment, and I and I am trying. It is a much larger. I, I, I see myself as part of a larger intellectual project, and I don't think any one person can do it all. And I'm perfectly happy to address historians, because that's where I that's where I am disciplinary in terms of my discipline. We have time for a short question. Uh, you Thank you very much. You have resisted an hour and a half in the uh, warm climate, and uh, indeed, uh, Prasanna has taken us in very different directions from methodologies to sources to indeed the conservatism of history, something that I confess I claim that that's the case uh, for the discipline of history uh, bro broadly defined. Um, so, uh, please do join me in thanking Prasanna for this. Very good.